So one of the things I tend to see students struggle with initially is recognizing the difference between infinite discontinuities and removable discontinuities. Not necessarily when a graph is shown like you see in the background here, but whenever you have a function presented and you have to analyze the function using limits and try to decide where the discontinuities are and what type of discontinuities we have. So to start this discussion, we've got the definition of continuity on this screen. There's three things that have to happen at a given location for a function to be continuous. You have to have the function being defined at that location. You have to have the limit existing at that location. And you have to have the limit and the function value equaling the same thing. These second two characteristics are popping up more frequently with piecewise functions, usually with functions that are, you know, just standard defined the same way throughout the entire domain usually it's because of the function being undefined which is why we have a discontinuity uh, that's going to be the focus of the rest of this video specifically when do we have an infinite discontinuity which is just a vertical asymptote versus when do we have a removable discontinuity which can also be referred to as a point discontinuity so the function that's here right now I just graphed this on Desmos, and this graph definitely has one of each type of discontinuity. We have a vertical discontinuity right here where the graph seems to be moving to infinity on one side of a certain x, and then down to negative infinity on the other side. And then this little hole that's poked out of the graph right here is what graphically a point discontinuity or a removable discontinuity is going to look like. We're definitely, as we approach that location from both sides, we're definitely not moving up to infinity or down to negative infinity, and we're definitely moving toward the same y value from each side of whatever this x value is. So what we'll do to try to support this idea is we'll check out this function for a little while. So the tasks that we want to perform with this function, we want to locate all of the discontinuities of the function. We then want to classify each discontinuity as removable or infinite. And then we want to remove any disc removable discontinuity by redefining the function. So the function we'll deal with is a rational function right here. This is a pretty frequently occurring type of function to be asked to handle from a calculus teacher, calculus professor, any calculus textbook. You can really do a lot with this one type of function. So you'll definitely see quite a few of these sprinkled throughout your, your limits chapter in that textbook. So first task, locate where this function is discontinuous. This function is not a piecewise function, so the most likely scenario is that if it's discontinuous, it's going to be discontinuous because it's undefined. This fraction is undefined when the denominator is equal to zero. So I set my denominator equal to zero. I solve that equation by factoring. I end up locating two values of x, x equals negative 3 and x equals 3, that make the function undefined. Therefore, I know I have discontinuities at each of those x's. So on the next screen, we'll try to handle this next issue. Classify each discontinuity as a removable discontinuity or an infinite discontinuity. So I need to do an analysis at each of the x's that we indicated at the end of the prior screen. What's happening with this function near x equals 3? What's happening with this function near x equals negative 3? We'll talk about the x equals 3 half of the screen first. So to try to decide what type of discontinuity we have at x equals 3, we're going to check a limit as we approach 3. Now, if you're not using epsilon delta proofs, if you're not using the definition of a limit, if you're just trying to evaluate limits, uh, the first step that you would typically do would be to put 3, the value x is approaching, in place of all the x's. So if you put 3 in place of this x, this x, and this x, you can do the calculation. What you're going to see that you get is negative 12 over 0. I always try to tell my students that is a signal. Negative 12 over 0 is undefined, and an undefined fraction is undefined because it's infinite. It, this implies, right, so that symbol right here stands for implies, this implies that we are going to get infinity or negative infinity, but the only way to confirm which we get is to do a one-sided analysis on each side of 3. So I try to emphasize this is a signal. When you try to evaluate a limit by plugging in, this is a signal. 
that you are going to get an infinite answer, but the only no way to know which infinity you get, positive versus negative, is to check the one-sided limits. So if you check the limit on the bigger side of 3, I'm going to be dealing with the factored form of the function. So I did factor the numerator. I did factor the denominator. That's what you see in the upper right. If I put 3 in place of this x, this x, this x, and this x, there's really only one location that I really have to be cautious with. 3 plus 3 is 6. Now, is that a 6.1 when I'm slightly bigger than 3? Yes. Is that a 5.9 when I'm slightly smaller than 3? Yes. I just need to know that this position in the numerator for each of the calculations we're currently looking at is certainly positive. Similarly, when I put 3 here, 3 minus 5 is 2. Excuse me, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. I don't care if that is a negative 2.1 or a negative 1.9. I need to know that both of those values are negative. In this position, I'm going to have a negative. In this position in the denominator, when I put 3 in, 3 plus 3 is 6. I don't care if it's a 6.1 or a 5.9. I need to recognize that that's positive. And then this last remaining x, when I put 3 there, 3 minus 3 is 0. That 0 in the denominator is the one you've got to be careful with. Now we want to carefully consider one-sidedness. A number slightly bigger than 3 goes in place of this x. A number like 3.1, 3.1 minus 3 is going to be slightly above 0. So now I just do my, my arithmetic. 6 times negative 2 is negative 12. 6 times 0 is 0, but a positive times a positive is a positive. A negative divided by a positive is a negative answer. In this case, it's an infinite answer. So I get negative infinity on the bigger side of 3. And then I do a similar analysis on the smaller side of 3. We've already got most of the components into place because we don't care if this is 5.9 or 6.1, negative 1.9, negative 2.1. This is positive. This is negative. This is positive. What about that place where the zero shows up in the denominator? So a number slightly smaller than 3, like 2.9, goes in place of this x. 2.9 minus 3 does get us close to zero, but pushes us a little bit beneath zero. Now it's time for the arithmetic. 6 times negative 2 is negative 12 still. 6 times 0 is 0 still. But a positive times a negative is a negative, And a negative divided by a negative is a positive answer. I've shown that I do have an infinite discontinuity or a vertical asymptote at x equals 3, and I've confirmed that on the bigger side of 3, I'm moving to, toward a y value of negative infinity, and on the smaller side of 3, I'm moving toward a y value of positive infinity. So this right here is a signal that you are dealing with an infinite discontinuity or a vertical asymptote. Now if you look at what happens when we try to do the same sort of analysis at negative 3, I put negative 3 in place of all of my x's in the numerator and the denominator. I still get 0 in the denominator, but I do not get 0, excuse me, I do not get a non-zero value in the numerator. I get 0 over 0. So you've likely talked about this as an indeterminate form within your calculus course. Uh, an indeterminate form is something we can't develop a, a fixed expression for. Zero divided by a number is supposed to be zero. A number divided by itself is supposed to be one. Something divided by zero is supposed to be undefined. Which of those is going to win out here? We don't know. That's why it's classified as an indeterminate form. I try to urge my students to think of this as a signal, zero over zero, as a signal to try to do some algebra and get some cancellation to occur. Uh, it's tempting, maybe, to try to say, all right, I'm just going to cancel this x squared with that x squared. There's my cancellation. If you do that, you're violating the order of operations because what's always implied but not shown when a fraction is presented this way are parentheses around the numerator and denominator. And if I reach into those parentheses to do that cancellation or to attempt to do that division, I'm violating the order of operations. So what we would need to do is we would need to factor the numerator. We've already shown that. Factor the denominator, we've already shown that. And once I'm factored, I can cancel common factors because I'm not reaching into parentheses to do the cancellation. I'm canceling entire factors that are shared between the top and bottom of the fraction. So once those common factors of x plus 3 are canceled from the numerator and denominator, we want to now put negative 3 in place of the x's that remain. If you do that, you end up with negative 8 over 6, which simplifies to 4 over 3. Because we got a finite value here, not 
infinity or negative infinity like we got on the other side of the screen that implies that we do have a removable discontinuity at this x negative three and the y value that we got for the result for that limit i'm going to click over to my desmos tab in my browser real fast uh, so here's a graph that i built of this function on desmos and if i click at negative three let's see if i can make it work there we go so negative three is undefined so there's where we have the removable discontinuity uh it doesn't show that unless you cursor over and actually physically click in and then we do see the vertical discontinuity at three so that's the graph that we actually had on a couple other screens within this video but how do i do the last task so keep in mind what that last task was for any removable discontinuity that you identify redefine the function so the discontinuity is removed. A couple different ways you can do this. After we do this cancellation here, the only difference between the function that's listed up at the top of the screen in factored form and what remains here within this limit evaluation is that what remains in the limit evaluation is only undefined at three. It's no longer undefined at negative three. So that actually removes the discontinuity. You're no longer undefined at the x of negative three. So this is one way to remove the discontinuity, probably the most frequently used way to remove the discontinuity. Another way that might be helpful to think about it, you def redefine the function as g of x, but you want g of x to equal f of x, the exact same thing, as long as x does not equal the location of the removable discontinuity. So what do you wanna do at the location of the removable discontinuity? Well, you wanna fill the open circle in the graph with a closed circle that has a y value of four thirds, and that's gonna be the y value just at x equals negative three. And if we come back to this graph that I can actually do a little bit of editing on, at negative three comma four thirds, we fill in that open circle with a closed circle, and we no longer have a discontinuity at negative three.